let's move right along with my presentation. I want to first uh, tell you who the Turtle Survival Alliance is. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of us, but we are a global organization dedicated to zero turtle extinctions. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit uh, of why we're so concerned about turtles right now. So who is the TSA? So the TSA was formed in 2001 uh, due to what we call the Asian turtle crisis. Basically, in the 1980s, 1990s, and even till today, turtles were being literally vacuumed up um, or should I say figuratively vacuumed up um, throughout Southeast Asia and the world to supply the food, pet, and traditional medicine markets of Southeast Asia. And this was so rampant that turtles everywhere were disappearing. So we started a task force called the Turtle Survival Alliance. Um, now we are a global nonprofit organization dedicated strictly to turtle and tortoise conservation. Uh, so we are a nonprofit. Uh, we're made up of a diverse assemblage of organizations, institutions, and individuals, all with a passion for saving turtles. Um, we have 900 dues-paying members, and that includes over 50 AZA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums accredited zoos. So a lot of the big zoos you can think of out there San Diego Zoo, um, Houston Zoo, Bronx Zoo. Those are all institutions that work with us to save turtles. Um, we have a lot of strategic partnerships. That means working with uh, government agencies. That means working with state agencies, other nonprofits um, to work in different regions of the world and most effectively be able to conserve the turtles there. And we have a commitment to zero turtle extinctions. Um, over the last 300 years, numerous turtle and tortoise species have already gone extinct. Now, that being said, there is really cool news. Uh, you all may have seen in the news uh, in the past few days, but a tortoise, a Galapagos tortoise, was discovered uh, by Forrest Gallant on the island of Fernandina in the Galapagos Islands. This species of tortoise hasn't been seen in 112 years. So they're going to do genetic testing on this tortoise. It's now in a very, very safe, secure environment. And it's going to prove if this is indeed a female of a species that went extinct 112 years ago. It's so awesome. Oh, by the way, uh, while I'm speaking, if at any time you don't understand something or you want clarification on something, please Type it in, and I will be glad to answer your question. We'll kind of keep this interactive. Um, so the thing is, we work all over the world. What makes these people uh, so dedicated to saving turtles? And we think it's because everybody has a turtle story. If you talk to anybody out there, most people have a turtle story. It might just be like you can see in the upper left-hand corner, a turtle crossing the road, or uh, for, uh, ge for one generation, having little turtles in a plastic tub, uh, maybe seeing a turtle at an aquarium, or, of course, turtles basking on a log. But everybody has this turtle story. How can we follow up on the turtle that was found? Um, so we at the Turtle Survival Alliance have a website, a Facebook page, and an Instagram page, and we will make sure we have the most timely updates on that uh, possibly extinct species of tortoise and what the genetics show us. Um, it's also going to air on Forrest Gallant's show on Animal Planet Extinct or Alive, and that should air this summer. Um, so everyone has a turtle story. They're like the, the common bond uh, between us all. You know, there's some animals out there that maybe people can't say we have a common story. Like, you don't oftentimes see an elephant crossing the road and help it into the woods on the other side. Or you can't always see a snow leopard. Um, but, uh, but turtles, that's one thing that I think is a part of all of our lives. So what we try to do at the TSA is provide catalytic moments. 
And what I mean by catalytic moments is that thing that inspires you, that first touch of a turtle or tortoise. Um, that is actually me on the left-hand side with the uh, blonde bowl cut. That was back in 1992. And that turtle I'm holding there, her name's Lucy. And she was a turtle that provided a catalytic moment for me. Um, so I, I used to go to the beach with my family in North Carolina during the summers. And I caught this turtle with my friends. It's called a diamondback terrapin. And I wanted to bring it home because I was a kid who loved turtles and was hoping to have a diamondback terrapin. And I brought her home and I just watched her in her glass aquarium every day and realized she wasn't happy. Uh, that's not where she belonged. So the next year when we went back to the beach, I took this turtle and I released her last year when we went back to the beach. I took this turtle and I released her back where I found her. And she swam off, looked around, and then dove down. And that was, let me tell you, I was crying. I was sobbing that my turtle was now back out in the wild. But the coolest part of it all is the next day we were leaving the beach and we drove back by and I said, all right, I have to stop and see if Lucy is there. And we drove up and boom, she popped her head up when we drove by and we stopped and she just looked at us for a minute and I knew it was the same turtle and then she dove down and she was gone. And for me, that was a catalytic moment. It made me want to see turtles and tortoises in the wild for the rest of my life. Um, on the right hand side, that's one of our programs in India. And I would hope that that boy there, who's probably the same age that I was back then, has a catalytic moment with those uh, what we call Indian tent turtles uh, so that he maybe someday or those girls there in the background, the other students, uh, want to protect turtles. And so those catalytic moments become a passion. And these are pictures of some of our TSA employees and members around the world working with the turtles in their native countries that they love. So what is conservation? So that's a big thing. We have to start there because conservation means many things to many people. It's For some, it's tangible. You can touch it. You, uh, you go down to a swamp and there's a frog and you catch it and you can feel it in your hands and you want to see those animals there year after year. And that's tangible. There, it's also kind of intangible as well, uh, just this sense that nature is in its proper place, that it's doing well. Um, for some people, like on the right-hand side, conservation is tigers in a zoo and making cute little furry baby tigers there. And so that's increasing their global population. Um, for others, it's like on the left-hand side, the California condor. California condors were driven to the brink of extinction only a couple decades ago because of lead poisoning. Hold up, a uh, little butterscotch here. The tortoise is uh, making some noise, so I'm gonna put him down below. Okay, there we go. Sorry, butterscotch. Um, so these California condors were brought back, and now they there's hundreds of them back in the valleys of uh, Southern California, Nevada, and Arizona. And so these animals, have returned to the wild, and that's conservation for some people. So at the TSA, we provide a lot of different services that all go to conservation. You see conservation there in the middle. We have education, research, assurance colonies, rescue and rehabilitation, captive breeding, lobbying, head starting and reintroduction. Those are all components, and each component is just as important as the other. You know, you might have an office job doing the, um, doing the taxes for a conservation organization. Well, at the end of the day, that is just as important as the biologists out in the field who are studying the animals, because everybody has to work together to make this goal happen. But to do that, passion has to be at the core of what you do. And so uh, we hope that that catalytic moment touching the turtle for the first time or helping it across the road uh, and seeing it go back off into the wild safely uh, will help spur a passion. 
So a lot of people ask me also, isn't conservation hard? I mean, the human population grows every day. We see pollution all over. Uh, we see you know, animals hit by cars, all sorts of things. And conservation is hard. There's no easy way to look at it. It's an uphill battle constantly. But as individuals, all you have to do is follow this simple rule of do what you can, where you can, when you can while you're here because the world depends on it. That means that if somebody is taking care of desert tortoises in California and somebody else is taking care of uh, red crowned roof turtles in India or somebody else is taking care of loggerhead sea turtles on the coast of Australia, everybody in their lifetime is doing that one little part to make the world a better place and of course for us make it a better place for turtles. So let's talk about some turtle stats because a lot of people aren't aware just how many turtles there are. There are 469 types of turtles and tortoises on this world uh, and only seven of those are marine so only seven are sea turtles. That uh, surprises most people. We hear so much about sea turtles, and we have to give them credit where credit is due. They're amazing animals. But that means that there is 462 types of turtles and tortoises that need our help. Um, so can anybody guess, and let's see you type it in, what do you think the most turtle-rich country is? Uh, what country in the world has the most kinds of turtles? I want to wait and see if I get a response here. Who's going to take the risk? Africa. So Africa is a continent with a lot of turtles. That's a good one. The Galapagos Islands of Ecuador, uh, also really good. China. China has uh, tons of turtle species. South Africa, also good. Ecuador, yes. Really good answers because those all have a lot of turtles. Australia, yes. Ready? I'm going to change the slide. Arthur, you win. The United States of America. So the United States of America is, if you look at this map with all that red area, this shows where the highest densities of turtle species are. The United States of America is the most turtle rich country in the world with 89 types of turtles and tortoises. Uh, the closest next is Mexico with 65. And then third place is India. And if you look, the third place country in the world has uh, less than half the types of turtles that the USA has. So uh, for, for all of you living in those top three countries, uh, congratulations. Uh, you have turtle rich countries and there's so much conservation work that can be done there. But the truth of the matter is, despite you seeing all those red hotspot areas of turtles, turtles are in trouble. Over 50% of turtles and tortoises face extinction risk. And we don't really think about that every day because we see turtles in the woods, we see them walking across the street, we see them in ponds and rivers. But the truth of the matter is, is that they are, have the greatest extinction risk of any order of vertebrates. Um, so that means that any other major group of animals, big cats, um, uh, pachyderms like elephants, uh, marine mammals, none of them are at the extinction, have the extinction risk that turtles have right now facing them. So right now is the time, it's a critical moment to do what we can for these cute beloved little creatures. So what are the threats to them? Well, like I said, there was the Asian turtle crisis. International poaching is really big. Uh, it's actually, a, it's a billion dollar industry, maybe more. Um, turtles are poached throughout the world to feed uh, the food, the pet, and the inter, uh, international traditional trade medicine markets. Uh, and unfortunately, the turtles are just taken up by thousands and thousands and thousands. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands to millions of turtles being taken out of the wild every year just to satiate the demand for these animals. Um, and then next, anthropogenic threats. And anthropogenic means human-created, human-induced threats. Things like subsidized predators, that's like raccoons and foxes and skunks and crows, 
all those feed on turtle eggs, feed on baby turtles. And the more of them there are, the more turtles, unfortunately, get eaten. And over time, if more turtles get eaten, the less turtles grow up to become adult reproducing turtles. Uh, then, of course, suburban sprawl, development. Uh, turtles getting uh, hit on road, we call that road mortality. Uh, deforestation, incidental bycatch, all of those huge threats to turtles that can happen anywhere in this world. But don't worry, the TSA is there to help. Uh, we have range country programs uh, in 16 different countries or regions around the world. So we really have a large global impact, such that we impact 20. We make a positive impact. That means we are breeding them. We are releasing them back in the wild. We are helping bring these turtles back from extinction. So we're helping 20 of the top 25 most endangered turtles, or 39 of the top 50 most endangered turtles. In fact, the TSA works with one third of the turtle species on Earth. So we really do have a large impact. But there's always more that can be done. You can do so much just in your own homes, in towns and communities to help turtles out. So what types of turtle is that? That's a really good question. That is a beautiful turtle. That is called uh, the golden-headed or yellow-headed box turtle. It is a Chinese native, and um, it is now uh, functionally extinct in the wild, which means that there might be a couple out there across the landscape uh, they live in this mountain range in China called the Huangshan Mountains, and there's probably not enough left to even have individuals breed with each other anymore. <laughs> yes, Deb, it is really, really cute. It's a super, it's one of my favorite turtles. They're amazing. Um, so again, showing you, these are the top 20 out of the 25 turtles that we make an impact for across the world. And you can see the little points that show where we work with those. Notice that most of the points go to Southeast Asia. Again, the Asian turtle crisis. These turtles are in a lot of trouble. And uh, most of the ones in the top 25 do come from Southeast Asia. So I want to take you around the world uh, to show you what we do in these different countries. So we're going to all uh, board TSA Air. You're going to have to put your tray tables up, uh, put your seats up, get comfy, put on a Snuggie or a, a, a neck brace in your classroom there. Hopefully your teachers uh, told you to bring those. Um, no, that is not me with no beard. That is uh, one of my best friends, Matt. He is a actual pilot, so that is him. And, uh, and he's going to uh, take us around the world right now. So first, we're going to go down from our headquarters in South Carolina to Belize. Belize is a tropical country in Central America. And we work with this incredible turtle um, called the Hicate, or Central American River Turtle. Uh, one of the most endangered turtles on Earth. It's critically endangered. It comes from one of the oldest lines of turtles on Earth. And turtles have been around for 220 million years. And this one right here comes from one of the oldest lineages. What is so cool about this turtle is they can basically survive underwater for a un nearly unlimited amount of time. Um, they have a highly vascularized uh, uh, papillae, uh, so these little things that grab oxygen in their larynx, in their throat. And so what they do is they pump water into their mouth like a fish. Uh, these uh, papillae grab the oxygen, it dissolves across the membrane of the papillae and goes into their bloodstream. Um, and then they expel the water through their nose. So they, they're, they're basically the turtle that is the closest to a fish. It's really cool. Um, but we partner with the Belize Foundation for Research and um, Environmental Education in Belize. Again, we partner all over the world. That's how we make these things happen to bring the Hicate back. Um, let's see, is the neck that, that long to increase the surface area for that function? It is. It's hard to see there, but they have a very long neck. Um, and so they are able to uh, take in the dissolved oxygen from the water. And what's amazing about that is this is Belize. 
Uh, these are cold-blooded animals. That is warm water. So they do have to extract enough oxygen from the water to be able to feed their metabolism in those warm waters. Um, so next, we're going to hop from Belize down to South America to Colombia. And in Colombia, we have an amazing program where we partner with the Wildlife Conservation Society and we're helped by uh, uh, numerous uh, different uh, organizations and funders like Disney, Econ Viva, and Santo Domingo Foundation. So this turtle here is called the Magdalena River turtle, and it lives in northern Colombia. Unfortunately, the rivers that it lives in in North, uh, North, uh, uh, northern Colombia are um, impacted by dams, hydroelectric dams, to uh, generate power. And when they put these dams in, what it does is it floods the nesting beaches. Well, much like sea turtles, this turtle comes up on the uh, sandy beaches and sandbars to lay their eggs. But if the dams flood the beaches, the turtles either can't lay their eggs or after they've laid their eggs, the water floods the beaches and the turtles drown. So what this amazing program has done is to go out and protect the nests, collect the eggs, translocate them, which means take them out of the nest, move them into safe hatcheries, hatch the babies, and release them into the wild. So now that they've been doing this for many years, they've been able to release thousands of these critically endangered turtles back into the wild in Colombia. And then they're also working with the communities uh, to really get the communities that live along the rivers uh, interested in turtle conservation and helping. And it's worked so well that the communities, you can see some of these pictures, they're so behind it. Uh, I mean, this is uh, almost grassroots uh, conservation at its best. The communities are fully behind that. And what, that's what we strive for at the TSA. Uh, next, we're going to go to Madagascar. Many of you have seen the movie. Most people haven't been there. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Madagascar last year for a month. Um, unfortunately, for a very sad reason. So last April, uh, this beautiful tortoise you see up in the left-hand corner called the radiated tortoise. Uh, it's not radiated because it went to this uh, some nuclear site and got uh, radioactive. It's radiated because the beautiful lines on the shell. Um, it is highly coveted by international turtle and tortoise smugglers. So they are taking radiated tortoises out of the wild by the thousands. Well, last year at the TSA, we got a call early in the morning. It was like 4 o'clock in the morning that radiated tortoises had been confiscated from poachers. And it turned out to be 10,196 of these tortoises. And these tortoises very, grow very large, and they grow very old. They can live up to almost 200 years old. So the TSA. Um, made a task force. We, we incorporated volunteers and different zoos and different nonprofits from around the country and around the world to go help these tortoises. And we gave them medical care. We gave them food and water. We actually stayed there in Madagascar for three months, nonstop, every morning to every night, giving these tortoises care. And through that, 90% of them, I think even 95% of them survived. And so now they're, they're in the country, they're doing well. And that's what we do all over Madagascar. We take care of radiated tortoises. We take care of plowshare tortoises, which is the tortoise in the lower left-hand corner. By the way, uh, that tortoise in the lower left-hand corner um, is the most endangered tortoise in the world. Uh, there's probably less than 50 of them, if that at best, in the wild. So the time is... It is, it's so critical to do what we can for this tortoise. Now, let me see. You have a question there. Uh, do you know how people get them out of the country? Uh, two major ways. Uh, they get them out of the country by airplane. They uh, pack them up into suitcases, as many tortoises as they can pack into suitcases, and try to get them out of the capital airport um, in the capital of Antananarivo. Um, that is where a lot of the confiscations get stopped. And then also, they get them out by boat. So uh, smugglers will pack them up into boxes. Again, it's really sad, as many tortoises as they can pack into one box. 
put them onto uh, a, a small boat that takes them out to a cargo ship offshore, and then that cargo ship takes off. Um, sadly, these animals are vanishing into the night. Uh, if you all have learned about the American bison or buffalo story here in the United States, this tortoise is undergoing the same thing. Um, this tortoise used to number anywhere from 12 to 20 million uh, only a few decades ago. Now they've been reduced uh, by more than three quarters. And at that rate, these tortoises could very well be extinct in the wild in the next 20 years. Uh, if police, FIBD, uh, oh, if police found the tortoises in a suitcase, what do they do with them? Do they call you? They do call us. Uh, so when they police find them, they immediately contact the Turtle Survival Alliance, and we come and get the tortoises, and we have six sanctuaries around Madagascar, uh, so we can take in these tortoises. They get veterinary care, food and water, uh, big spacious environments built actually into their native forest in which they can live safely protected. Um, so let me go on. So now we're going to jump from Madagascar. Uh, again, after I'm done, maybe if there's more uh, time, we can answer que uh, more questions. Because Madagascar is fascinating. Um, so we're going to go to India. Um, whoop. There we go. So we're going to go to India, and India is our largest TSA program, actually. It spans uh, five different regions in the country, and the foundation of it is behind this incredible turtle you see in the left-hand corner. That is, it's like the peacock of the turtle world. It is so gorgeous. Um, I wish all of you someday can travel to India and see this turtle in person. It's called the Indian red-crowned roof turtle, and it is a critically endangered species, and it lives in the rivers of India. And much like sea turtles and much like the program in Colombia, those turtles come up on beaches in this river called the Shambhal to nest. Um, unfortunately, poachers take the eggs, um, uh, monitor lizards come down and take the eggs, uh, wild jackals, wild pigs. So as a critically endangered species, we have to protect this turtle. So the same kind of thing. Uh, we have people there that during the whole nesting season go out, they dig up the eggs, they translocate them, so move them to protected hatcheries, and then the coolest thing happens. Our, our, uh, our field technicians, our volunteers, set up tents next to the uh, hatcheries, and they stay there the whole entire time, all uh, four months while they're incubating, and, and hatching uh, so to protect the nests. And as you can see in the lower left-hand corner, we get the communities really engaged in this one too, uh, as well. Uh, they get so engaged with helping the red crown roof turtle. Uh, students come out and help release them. Uh, uh, citizens help uh, tell each other about the red crown roof turtle and how to protect it. Uh, they're faced with other threats like incidental, uh, which means basically accidental, uh, drowning in, in, in fishing nets, um, unauthorized fishing, uh, things like damming and sand mining. But this has been a really successful program. Um, lately, we've had to um, kind of not switch focus, but take on another big task because this other really uh, cool turtle, it's an uh, enigmatic turtle, we call it. It's, uh, it's it's just so interesting and it's an enigma to us. It's called a flap shell turtle. It's kind of like right in between a soft shell turtle and a hard shell turtle. It's like the evolutionary link in between those. And they are being poached out of India illegally um, by the tens and tens of thousands for food. So what we've been doing is uh, working with uh, the police in India, the government, to stop these poachers to get these uh, turtles back from the poachers, rehabilitate them, and release them. And so we've been working on that all winter long. Um, so from India, I want to jump over to Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh is a Southeast Asian country. Um, again, a country um, very few have been to. It's a really interesting country, amazing habitats there. 
Um, they have this place called the Sundarbans there. Um, and the Sundarbans is in southwest Bangladesh into India. And it's this huge, it's the biggest mangrove forest in the world. So the mangroves, these plants that grow in the uh, salty tidal flats. And they have uh, tigers that live just in the uh, Sundarbans. They have uh, crocodiles. And then they have this. Uh, that turtle that you can see there is, again, one of the most critically endangered turtles. It's called the Batagir Basca, the, um, the Northern River Terrapin. And there are only literally a handful left in the wild. That's how few their numbers are. So again, uh, we're working to bring all the turtles that we can into safe, protected breeding colonies called assurance colonies have them breed, have them lay eggs, hatch the eggs, and then raise the young till they're a larger size. And then we do really cool stuff uh, called radio telemetry, where we put radio transmitters on some of the turtles so that we can track where they go, because the Sunderbans is such a big area. It's tidally influenced. You have water flowing everywhere. It's this really cool, it's like a maze of mangroves. And to learn where the turtles go and what habitat they use, uh, doing these sonic telemetry is the only way to do it. So from Bangladesh, we're going to hop over to Myanmar. And Myanmar has a conservation success story that's on the level with bald eagles, uh, American alligators, gray wolves, um, in that it is a species that was taken from being functionally extinct. That means there's only a few left in the wild. That was taken from being functionally extinct. That means there's only a few left in the wild, and they probably will never meet each other to breed. Um, we've taken it from being functionally extinct, now 15 years later, to having uh, about 20,000 of them uh, in Myanmar and around the world, most of those being in Myanmar, though. Um, where they are now being released back into the wild by the thousands, not by the tens, not by the hundreds, but by the thousands. Um, and again, they're radio tracking them. And if you look in the lower right-hand corner, this is the coolest thing. These tortoises are already breeding in the wild. We're already finding new little cute, super cute hatchling tortoises um, out in the wild in Myanmar, also known as Burma. Now, one thing that uh, we do to protect the uh, tortoises, uh, if you look on the lower left, you'll see that there's engravings on the tortoises. These are actually tattoos. And one side of the tortoise gets a tattoo of its unique code number. They all get uh, pit tags, which are passive integrated transponder tags, like you put in a, a cat or a dog, little microchips. Um, and then on the other side, they get Buddhist icons. And those Buddhist icons give a spiritual protection to the tortoises so that uh, people who might come across them or poachers uh, uh, who are, you know, uh, religious will know that taking this turtle or harming this turtle is basically it goes against Buddhism. It goes against their religion. So to leave them alone. And this is an incredible success story. Um, if, if, if you ever want to model something for, for any animal, doing it for the Burmese star tortoise is one that's uh, really great. So next we're going to go again to, in Southeast Asia down to Cambodia. Uh, and if you look at that turtle there, it's almost like a devil turtle. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating. It's beautiful. It's unique. Uh, it's the Southern River Terrapin, and they, the males, uh, they get this jet black coloration during breeding season. Uh, and most people don't think that a, a turtle could change colors during breeding season like a bird would. Like when birds migrate in the fall, they come down, and most of them are brown or they're kind of this muddy color. Uh, and then they go down to Central and South America for the winter, and then they come back up. And they're in these beautiful breeding plumages, these beautiful breeding colors. And that's what this turtle does. So the males will turn a beautiful jet black color and get these bright golden eyes during the breeding season. So in Cambodia, 
we're primarily working with the Wildlife Conservation Society and, uh, and uh, Wildlife Reserve Singapore and Ocean Park Hong Kong, uh, to, uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the Cambodian government to bring this turtle back. Again, this is another turtle who, yep, you can count it on about two hands how many wild turtles there are left out there, maybe even one hand. Um, this turtle is extremely rare, and again, it's a riverine turtle. Notice that I've been talking a lot about these riverine turtles. Uh, there's so many things that can impact these riverine turtles in Southeast Asia. Uh, things like I said, sand mining, uh, getting caught in fishing gear, um, um, destroying nesting beaches, uh, poaching them for food and pets. So a lot uh, of anthropogenic, again, human-induced uh, issues are, are having uh, uh, impact on this turtle. Uh, but again, the uh, Wildlife Conservation Society and us and the other organizations are uh, protecting eggs, we're protecting the beaches, we're uh, hatching the eggs, uh, raising the young up in these assurance colonies, we, we call them, and then returning them to the wild. Um, just last year, last November, we released 25 of these uh, now large sub-adult uh, turtles back into the wild and uh, put radio transmitters, sonic transmitters on the backs of the turtles to follow where they're going in this river system. So um, what's really neat is, you know, we get to travel at the TSA. My coworkers get to travel. And, uh, and so just two weeks ago, uh, my two of my coworkers were in Cambodia building new immense ponds for breeding these turtles. Uh, let's see what your question is. It looks like this one's face and neck are black, but its eye is bright yellow. Is there an evolutionary reason for this that you know of? Um, why exactly it turns bright yellow? I'm not sure. Uh, I would love to answer that question for you. Uh, yes, it's. It's obviously built into their genetics over uh, eons, um, but it does make for a very, very striking coloration. Now, uh, when uh, female turtles are selecting a mate, uh, they, they will be selective. They'll look just like a bird. They'll look for that male who displays the, the uh, strongest qualities. Um, I would say that if you're a female turtle, a male with a really good jet black coloration and bright golden eyes is going to be uh, much more um, uh, fit for mating uh, in, in the female's perspective. Oh, what's my favorite turtle? Oh, gosh, that's hard. Probably the diamondback terrapin, but, oh, I love wood turtles. I love box turtles. I love spotted turtles. Uh, and of course, all these ones, like I said, the yellow-headed box turtle, and oh, these ones I'm talking about right now, these uh, southern river terrapins are incredible. Um, and do they mate for life? Uh, turtles do not mate for life. Um, typically during breeding season for some of these aquatic turtles, they'll create what's called these breeding aggregates. Uh, just think of an aggregate as a group and they, uh, the turtles will mate with one another. And this happens with sea turtles as well. Uh, and then they all just kind of go their separate ways. Uh, now for turtles living in a small pond, uh, they probably see each other all the time. Uh, for turtles like a box turtle or a tortoise, for the most part, um, uh, mating is actually gonna happen by happenstance, really. Uh, the, a box turtle in a forest, for instance, uh, cannot sense that there is another box turtle, like a, a male sensing a female or a female sensing a male's pheromones or these, these pheromones that they would give off. Uh, they actually have to find one each other by happenstance. So walking through the woods and then they see another box turtle and then the male has to court the female and mate. That was a good question. Um, so then we're going to pop down to Indonesia. Indonesia is this whole entire uh, chain of islands in Southeast Asia. And again, we work with one of these beautiful turtles. This is called the Painted Terrapin. And uh, my friend Joko Gunturo, he is uh, with the organization called the Satyasita Foundation. And we partner with them 
to again work with these turtles they and it's amazing these guys they go out on the beaches during nesting season it's hot it's humid and they will walk for miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers every night looking for these turtles nesting and these aren't like huge sea turtles coming up and nesting these are uh turtles that are about i'd say you know maybe 15 inches long they're still large but not as big as a sea turtle and again they will find the nests dig up the eggs move them to safe protected hatcheries hatch them and then again what's really cool what we try to do in all of our programs is the community gets involved and goes and releases these turtles so every year they release between 500 to a thousand of these critically endangered painted terrapins. So Lee, uh, why is its nose red? Um, okay, so that's a really good question. So that turtle in the left-hand corner, uh, again, is this one is a male turtle. And this doesn't happen with all male turtles, but for these kinds of river turtles, um, all these ones that can change color are in a genus called Batagir. And Batagir only lives in Southeast Asia, but they are known for the males changing color during breeding season. So for this male, the red crown of its head, kind of like the red uh, head on a cardinal or, or something like that, turns this bright red on the top, on the crown, during breeding season to attract a female. Does any kind of turtle, tortoise, or terrapin care for their young? So for the most part, uh, turtles, tortoises, terrapin sea turtles lay their eggs. The eggs hat, the female then leaves, um, and then the eggs hatch and the babies crawl out and they start life on their own. They have all these instincts, millions of years of instincts packed into their tiny bodies and they go about life alone. But there's been some really, really cool research in South America recently showing turtle species that can actually communicate underwater. And we're seeing it with that turtle species, but that means we might be actually coming on to something with, who knows, all turtle species uh, that they're communicating with one another. And through their research in South America and Brazil, they're seeing the big female turtles wading offshore off these sandbars this turtle is called the giant South American river turtle, or the um, and the uh, and the when the hatchlings come out, the females will make sounds underwater, and the hatchlings will follow the females to the best hiding spots and the best food spots. So it's opening up this whole Pandora's box for what we didn't know about turtles and for what we can research and find out. So it's so cool. Okay, also, also, again, Donna, that was an awesome question. Um, thank you, Lynn, I appreciate it. Um, so we're gonna go to China. China, again, it's, it, it's an amazing country. I actually used to live in China when I was young. Uh, my father, if you can imagine, he looks just like me, but he speaks fluent Chinese. Um, um, but China is a country with amazing turtles. Uh, sadly, however, it's also a country that has has so many endangered turtles in it, um, and that's part of that Asian turtle crisis. Um, but in China and in Vietnam, I mean, I meant to uh, mention Vietnam in there as well. They have this turtle called the Yangtze giant softshell turtle, and this is a softshell turtle with this cute little snout on top that is about as big as a sea turtle. They're huge, um, but they're very, very, very endangered. And when I say that, I mean that this is one of the most endangered animals in the world. Not one of the most endangered turtles, most endangered animals. Look on this screen right here. From the top left all the way to the bottom right, there are four turtles pictured. That's it. That is how many individuals of this species are left in the wild. There's four of them that we know of. Two of them live in the Suzhou Zoo uh, in China. And two of them that we know of live in large lakes in northern Vietnam. 
Sadly, however, the female turtle at the Suzhou Zoo um, has, has laid infertile eggs over the past, I think, about six, seven years. Um, and that is uh, something that now for the past five years we have been working on. And what's really cool is we've been working on, as you can see in that top middle picture, the best turtle reproductive biologists and veterinarians in the world are trying artificial insemination technology with the world's rarest turtle and one of the world's rarest animals. Um, uh, so yes, this turtle is the new Martha the path passenger pigeon. If we don't do what we can for these turtles now, this turtle uh, could very well face extinction. The turtle in the upper left-hand corner, that female turtle is 100 years old. The male that's in the middle picture right now being checked out by the doctors, he's over 85 years old. Uh, the, so yes, so uh, Donna asked if there's only one female. We, there's only one female known in the world. The two turtles that live in these giant lakes in Vietnam, we don't know the sex of because they've only been spotted with binoculars. But now uh, there is this huge effort in Vietnam to find more turtles and we're hopefully going to try to get the turtles in those lakes in Vietnam. And the, the big partner there is the Asian Turtle Program, who's really doing so much legwork to try to find the, more turtles of the species in Vietnam, get these turtles, and hopefully be able to breed them. Uh, if they don't have successful reproduction, this turtle could unfortunately be lost to the world forever. Uh, what is their normal lifespan? Uh, we don't really know with this species. Like I said, the female is about 100. Uh, we think this species lives anywhere between 100 to 150 years old. But here's what's really neat about turtles, is unlike mammals and some other uh, species of animal, uh, or, or types of animals, taxa, turtles are able to reproduce just as good on their first year of reproduction, or if not better, uh, in their later age. A 100-year-old turtle could lay uh, just as many and just as many fertile eggs and have just as many babies as a 20-year-old turtle. So they are built for a long lifespan. All right, finally I wanna come back here to where I live in the United States and tell you about this really cool program. Now, if any of you out there are 18 years old, uh, or in some of the states, if you're as young as 14 years old, we have this program here in the United States where you can get involved. It is the only turtle research program of its breadth of its kind here in the United States. And what we do is we have citizen scientists come out with our professional biologists in Texas, Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Tennessee and research turtles with us and it's so cool like this is this is like vacation okay so we put on wetsuits we put on masks snorkel fins and we go in these springs and we catch the turtles we take all of their measurements what sex they are uh, we put a little pit tag in them a little microchip so we can track them and we track them for years and years so that we can get an idea in these uh, environments across these different states, how are the turtles doing? How are they doing over many years? And as you can see, there's people of all ages in these photos. Uh, you know, people from, like I said, uh, I think in Texas, our youngest researcher was seven years old, uh, came out to help us out. He came with his parents, uh, all the way up to people in their uh, 60s and 70s. So something anybody can get involved in. So yeah, there we go. How can we do that? Um, at the end, I'm gonna show you exactly how you can do that and get involved. Um, and so we're gonna uh, end our world tour, landing back into, uh, into Charleston here in South Carolina where we're based at, at our Turtle Survival Center. And the Turtle Survival Center is this uh, center uh, that we have 
uh, some of the world's most endangered turtles and tortoises at, uh, where we can have assurance colonies, which means if they go extinct in the wild, we'll be able to preserve the species. Uh, we can breed them here. We can study them. Uh, we have turtles at this facility that no longer even exist in the wild, but they are reproducing well here in coastal South Carolina. And uh, if anybody ever travels to South Carolina, um, please get in touch with us at the TSA and maybe we could set up a tour to be able to see this incredible facility. Um, we have, uh, they get vet care here. Uh, they get these uh, amazing greenhouses in which they live in, ponds. Uh, we even have a big barn for tortoises, kind of like horses. So they can be out in the pasture during the day and come in at night or when it's cold. So it's really, really cool. Um, so finally, I'm passionate about turtles. Uh, kind of like you're asking, how can we get involved? Well, one, um, please join us at the TSA. Uh, Turtle Survival Alliance is uh, the, the biggest, most widespread turtle and tortoise conservation uh, organization in the world. No matter where you live, you can get involved. You can become a member. Um, Oh, I want to answer this real quick. Do turtles do better in captivity or in the wild? Really good question. So going all the way back to my presentation about conservation. With conservation, we want turtles to be in the wild. That is where all animals truly belong. The sad fact of the matter is for some animals, like some of these critically endangered turtles, the wild is no longer safe enough for them to be in. And so in some cases, we have to keep them in captivity for their own safety. Now what we do is we keep them in these assurance colonies so they can reproduce, and then someday when uh, things are better in their habitat, we can return these animals to the wild. But in my opinion, a turtle or any animal in the wild is always the most beautiful place it can be. Um, so next, how can I get more involved? Again, if you all ever come to South Carolina, please get in touch with us and come out to the Turtle Survival Center. Um, get, join that North American Freshwater Turtle Research Group out in the springs. Um, and then if you really, really love turtles and really want to get involved, uh, maybe someday want to have a job like me where uh, you are a professional turtle biologist uh, we have a symposium every single year, and this year it's going to be in Tucson, Arizona. Um, so if you're ever interested in coming out and learning more about turtles, that's the perfect place to do it. Okay, and of course, uh, many of us out there have smartphones now or tablets or computers. Uh, so uh, I have an obsession, right, with turtles. How can I get more involved? Well, one, go to our website, www.turtlesurvival.org. You can also check out what we do on our Facebook at Turtle Survival, on Instagram at Turtle Survival, and on, at Twitter on Turtle Survival. But how can you get more involved in your hometown? Well, I know turtle people all across the U.S. If anybody in these uh, watching wants to ever contact me directly at the Turtle Survival Alliance, uh, you can go to the website and ask uh, and, and look for how you can send us an email to get involved in your state. But like I said, conservation is, is all these little components put together to make this one big global view. So the best thing to do is start in your hometown, start right there in your community with helping turtles cross the road. Uh, maybe turtles are nesting in an unsafe area and you can get a program going to uh, protect the nests. Maybe people are even just catching turtles on fishing line and not treating them well and you can go and explain to them uh, how, how, how they can help turtles uh, uh, rather than harm them. There's so many different ways. And again, feel free to contact us at the Turtle Survival Alliance. We know people in every single state uh, and that we could help you all get involved. Um, so what I want to leave you on is a quote from this gentleman named John Baylor. And John Baylor was this amazing turtle biologist. And he said, despite problems conserving turtles, there, will, or there are success stories. 
These have been long, arduous affairs, and for the most part, they have been the work of extraordinarily dedicated individuals. The turtle wars will be fought and won by individual turtle men and turtle women who are on divine missions from the Colonian gods to save their species. And I think that just sums it up for me and for all of my colleagues and friends around the world who have dedicated our lives to turtles, we are fighting to keep these beautiful animals on the planet. There is only so much time left for them if we don't act, and basically the time is now. So I wanna thank you all very much for listening and for asking me questions. And I think we have a few more minutes. If you all would like to ask me any turtle question, any turtle question on earth, I'll answer it for you. So please go ahead and ask a couple questions. We have a couple minutes. I'll look down at my screen. Or Were you excited to learn that they found the tortoise in the Galapagos that they thought was extinct? You bet I was. Um, it's always amazing for us to find an animal that we thought was lost for so long. This is not the first turtle or tortoise that they thought was extinct that they found again. Um, and so it gives us hope that this tortoise could be uh, returned from basically an animal lost forever to maybe an animal with a breeding population. But what's really cool about it is us in the conservation community are so connected with one another that the uh, gentleman who found the tortoise, Forrest Gallant, and his expedition team, uh, Forrest is a good friend of several of my friends. So I know that for them, it was so amazing to have one of their good friends find this tortoise that was thought to be extinct. Good question. Who's your favorite ninja turtle? <laughs> Uh, I think it's Raphael. Uh, I was always a huge fan of Raphael. Uh, I love the color red. And also, uh, I remember Raphael being, uh, you know, he, he had the cool size and he could mix it up like this with the size. And I think that'd be more my style. So, yeah, Raphael. Um, do most turtles hibernate? If they do hibernate, do they do it in mud? Awesome question. So this also brings me to a really cool learning point. Turtles and tortoises and reptiles don't hibernate. What they do instead is they, uh, is they brew mate. So when an animal hibernates is, this, uh, is they brew mate. So when an animal hibernates is this whole other physiological thing going on with their body than with a cold-blooded animal like a reptile, reptile or an amphibian with which brewmates. So a, a, a warm-blooded animal like a chipmunk uh, will store up fat and then their heart will go to an extremely low beat while they're cold, basically shutting down their body. When it starts to warm up, their heart will basically kickstart again and start beating back at its normal rhythm. A, a turtle or a tortoise or a reptile, because they're cold-blooded, the outside temperatures affect their inside body. And so what happens is when it gets cold, the turtle or tortoise gets colder and colder, and they go into this uh, state of basically torpor or brumation. Now, if you warm them back up, they will then, their bodies will warm and they'll come back to life. Um, but not all turtles and tortoises brumate. Uh, really only turtles or tortoises that live in areas that get cold enough for them to brewmate. And, um, and some turtles that live in hot, hot, hot areas, like in sub-Saharan Africa, might go into what we call an estivation. And an estivation is where their body almost shuts down because it's too hot. So they go into this kind of hibernation-like state called estivation. Um, um, can we see butterscotch again? <laughs> I knew somebody would ask that. Yes, you can. So again, this is butterscotch, and butterscotch is a Forston's tortoise, 
a Orasulawesi forest tortoise. Let me get him up close to the camera. Oh, he's so cute. Um, and he is a critically endangered species. So say hi to everybody, Butterscotch. Let's see, some more questions. How long can their claws go grow? Well, that really depends on the species. Some claws only grow to a certain length, like that long. Others, like of uh, uh, cooters or, ma or uh, painted turtles or sliders, will grow these really, really long sword-like claws that kind of look like wolverine. Uh, and they actually use those to tickle the face of a female turtle. If you all have ever seen uh, videos online of uh, turtles going like this, what that is is to uh, court the female into breeding. It's really interesting. Are there any turtles in Alaska? Yes, there are. Um, so I have some friends. One of my really good friends is the curator of animals at the um, uh, Alaska Museum in Anchorage. And she tells me that she sees red-eared slider turtles in the ponds in Alaska. And they can actually now overwinter or brumate, like I was saying, as far north as Alaska. Uh, the red-eared slider is the most, I'd say, prolific turtle on Earth in that uh, they've been traded all over for the pet trade and people have released them. And now the red-eared slider lives on every continent of the Earth except for Antarctica. But they live as far north as the, uh, Norway, Sweden, Alaska, way up into Canada. Um, it's amazing, really what they've been able to do. Um, sadly, they're still an invasive species, but that doesn't mean that their adaptation strategy hasn't been incredible. Let's see, how much bigger will butterscotch get? So butterscotch is going to get about this big, about one foot long, um, and a butterscotch now is kind of flat. Its shell will actually grow into a nice big dome uh, once it's an adult, so it's really cool. And like, it raises, <laughs> kind of like a, a, a muffin in the oven. Um, yes, it is cute. Do any climb trees? There are climbing turtles out there. Uh, now, as far as trees go, maybe not so much, but uh, some turtles off the top of my head that climb, the North American wood turtle that lives in the United States and Southern Canada, they're very good at climbing. Uh, snapping turtles are very good at climbing. Uh, box turtles are good at climbing. Uh, then there's this one in Southeast Asia called the Chinese big-headed turtle. And it has this great big fat head, uh, but this flat little shell, but its tail is about as long as its shell. And it can use that tail, basically it's almost prehensile. So it's almost like something that can hook onto things and use it to crawl up rock walls. Uh, and that kind of turtle lives in these very steep, uh, clear flowing streams in like Thailand and uh, Cambodia and Laos. And uh, so there are turtles that can climb, yeah. Oh, I like that, wow, 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 wow. So uh, if anybody has any more questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Um, I, I'm not sure how much more time I have. Maybe, uh, maybe Deb can tell me. Is there a turtle that can have a live birth? Um, so no, all turtles uh, lay eggs. Um, some lay very hard-shelled eggs, like a, uh, a tortoise typically lays a hard-shelled egg, while like a red-eared slider or a spotted turtle. Um, lays a uh, kind of a soft-shelled egg. It's very leathery in texture. Um, but, the, but all turtles uh, and tortoises undergo the same type of incubation process in that the warmth of the ground incubates the egg. And then after anywhere from 45 days all the way to a full year for some species, the egg will then hatch out. Um, what's really, really neat is the turtle that I showed you at the very beginning, the hickety or the Central American River turtle that can kind of breathe underwater, they will lay their eggs in mud right along the bank of the river. 
and the river levels will rise and it will flood the eggs. Now, for a lot of turtle species, that would mean doom if water flooded the eggs. But for that species and some others around the world, when the, uh, the water levels flood the eggs, the eggs go into this state called a diapause. And that means that they actually arrest or stop development until the water levels go down again and then they start developing again. I mean, that is extraordinary evolution right there. Um, all right. Hey, thank you so much. I, I, I'm glad you all uh, learned something and, and enjoyed this chat. Um, if there's any last question, I'd be glad to take. If not, uh, please uh, uh, follow us at the TSA. Uh, Debbie says, I was just in South Carolina last week. Wish I knew to visit you guys. Ah, I wish you knew too. I would, I would be glad to take you around and, and show you our turtle survival center. So I'm sorry I missed you. But um, again, please, everybody, uh, feel free to uh, check us out on our website, our Instagram, our Facebook at Turtle Survival or TurtleSurvival.org. Get involved with this. Drop us an email if you want to learn more. Uh, I would be glad to uh, help each and every student out there who wants to learn about turtles, learn about turtles and learn how they can get involved. So thank you all so much. And uh, I hope to see you again on another uh, uh, biodiversity teaching. Okay, take care.